So, Ramesh and Regine, in the live show, we didn't have time to talk about everything we wanted to talk about, of course, because this is such a big subject. Ramita, can I ask you a little bit about the young women who are spearheading this revolution? So, I think it's really important to acknowledge that young Iranian women, particularly in urban centres, have been spearheading these protests because of societal, cultural changes that have happened in the last 10 to 15 years, which have been seismic. I want to preface this by saying this is a particularly urban phenomenon. Um, And we did talk about um, the Kurds and the Baluchis in different parts of the country uh, being disproportionately targeted and killed. So what I'm talking about here is uh, the urban centres like Tehran. And what's happening in these urban centres is that you've got this younger generation, Generation Z, who are absolutely fearless. And they're very different to my generation. And Regine, you're, you're a bit younger than me, but I imagine your generation as well. Now, these changes that have happened in the last 10, 15 years, um, there's basically been a sexual awakening happening in Tehran. And as we know, you can't have equality without a sexual revolution, without sexual Mm. freedom and without sexual equality. This is why this is so important. The sexual awakening, I wouldn't call it a revolution, but is has been, you know, a driving force um, in young people wanting autonomy over their own bodies and, of course, freedom in their lives. Because, of course, the Islamic regime polices its citizens' most intimate affairs. And what's happened is that, for example, virginity is not what it used to be in Iran. Virginity was the cornerstone of this Iranian patriarchal society. That's no longer the case. You've got ordinary Iranians, not your rich upper class Iranians who live in the rich northern parts of town. You've got middle and lower middle class Iranians who are now living together before marriage. In fact, so many ordinary Iranians were living together before marriage. that The Supreme Leader's office issued an edict about how terrible this is. Now, this is a massive shift in thinking and in society. Wow. That's absolutely extraordinary. So... When those changes are happening, and this is the difference between something happening in law and happening in practice, isn't it? This is where you're getting a cultural shift before a legal shift. And so we've seen this in other parts of the world, you know, before gay rights are enacted into law or abortion is decriminalized, we see people finding ways of doing it. And often the laws change in response to the fact that it's becoming a bit absurd that something's illegal when so many people are doing it. But this is, in Iran, a such a brave thing to be doing, such an extraordinarily brave thing to be doing. I know. Can you imagine? You can get flogged. Uh, you can end up killed for not covering your hair and your body properly. And yet this shows you the regime can't contain its population. It can't control its population. And yet you've got young Iranians having sex outside marriage, living together outside marriage. Where do you think this Gen Z get this bravery from, this fearlessness from? Because it seems to be a phenomenon all over the world. Do you think it is the internet that has allowed them to speak to each other? And, you know, everything from, you know, Greta Thunberg to people marching to Washington against gun control, that kind of thing. But those things don't have anywhere near the cost of this, the potential cost of this. Some people have lost their lives already because of this. I think in Iran, partly the older generations had something to lose. First of all, the revolution happened and then the war happened, right? We had eight years of war. Um, Then there was rebuilding after the war. So it was really hard then to revolt because there was a war going on, a million people killed on both sides. And by the time the war ended and rebuilding ended, people felt they had something to lose of the older generations. This generation, Gen Z, feels like it has nothing to lose. And that's what happens. We saw that in Syria. We saw that in the Arab Spring. That's what happens when there's true revolt. People feel like they have nothing to lose. That's one of the ingredients of a revolution. Also, I would agree with you that it is access to global culture, 
global popular culture. So it's the internet, um, it's television, it's satellite TV that has connected Iranians globally to the world. And this generation, Gen Z, knows, uh, unlike the older generations that didn't have the internet, that didn't have satellite TV, this younger generation knows what's out there in the world. They know what they're missing. I think this has massively influenced them. Rajin, what are your thoughts? Um, yeah, I agree. Um, I think um, internet definitely helped because, like, um, I was born in the 80s. So um, even, like, I think first time I had internet, I was just going to university or something. Um, and the thing with the um, sexual stuff is um, it's also a tradition ra- as well as the religion so like even the families that they were not traditionally they they were not religious traditionally they didn't want their kids to have sex before they get married and stuff so and the kids like um then everyone even if you are having sex you're not telling your friends like between us we wouldn't talk either um and I think that's what has changed a lot because like of course you go online and then like it's a lot more normalized, so it's easier for them to it's, talk. It's to easy to be anonymous as well. Like, you, know, isn't it? you know, you know what I heard uh, during the protests in two thousand nine. So the two th- protests in two thousand nine were huge, not as big as two thousand nineteen. Nowhere near as big as the protests that are happening now. But I don't know if you remember, but it, people were protesting. It was really middle class protests over what they said was a rigged election. President Ahmadinejad got re-elected and Iranians went out into the streets. And actually, that was the single biggest protest that's ever happened in Iran. On one day, a million Iranians protested. I spoke to lots of young protesters then, and it was interesting what they were saying. They were saying that they had lots of sex during those protests because their having sex was like a one-fingered salute to the regime. You Mm. can't control what I do with my body. And I had Mm. lots of really open conversations with young men and women about them having loads of sex during these protests. And that kind of snowballed and has continued. And sex has become now this space where young Iranians see it as the final frontier of their freedom, that actually this is autonomy and agency over their bodies and over their lives, and it's symbolic of freedom. It always comes down to the same things, doesn't it? No matter where you are, what your culture, what the the history of the country, the dictatorships, the religions, no matter what it is, it does always come back to the, to the autonomy of the self, the humanity inside all of us, the the human being that doesn't want to be controlled, that wants to just exist and breathe and connect and eat and have sex and be together with each other. And it always comes back to this. And this is such an extraordinary and heartening story to hear. The thing is like, um, it's not like it's finished. <laughs> there's like, there's still, there's a, still a lot of people in Iran that they still like, if they see their sister having sex, they like want to kill them. Um, the culture is still unfortunately there and these kids are still being rebels and I and I'm proud of them Uh, it's a beginning that's what I'm just trying to say and also I want to say that um, even the people who are religious and they still don't want the kids to have sex before marriage are speaking up against the government at the moment so it's not just the more open-minded not religious people everybody want them down and it comes back again to the financial problems in Iran and how much they've been stealing of everyone and how much everyone's poor and they can't afford like a basic living cost. Um, so, yeah, I mean, obviously a revolution have a lot Yeah, of this is just one aspect. And actually it's a very urban mm. aspect as well. Yeah. Tehran has always been really different from everywhere else. And I I grew up in Tehran. I didn't really know about other places. And then you go there and you're like, okay. So it's a, it's a good reminder that it's a very complicated issue. And like all movements and unrest, there are many, many factors. And different citizens in any country will have different frustrations and angers at the government. And, and they're fighting for different sorts of liberty and freedom. And sometimes it's the, you know financial as well, that the, gov- the ways in which the government's oppressing them.
can I ask it in terms of this sexual shift? Where does that leave queer people? Is there a known underground queer scene? Is that something that you don't know about? Um, when I was a teenager, I didn't even know what's a lesbian, to be honest. I just thought there was something wrong with me. Uh, <laughs> and um, uh, no, it's I had a, when I was like a little bit older in my twenties. I had a few gay boyfriends, and um, for the boys, they could um, go to the official government doctor and get this paper that says they're mentally ill. So then when they get arrested, they show the paper and they say, I'm mentally ill and they would let them go. Or they didn't have to go to the army anymore. Uh, because obviously as a gay boy, you don't want to go to the army. Like, it's dangerous. Um, but at the moment, obviously, for the same reason that every other, like, everyone's just a bit more open at the moment. I know there's a group called Shishrang, which is six, uh, six colour. Um, they're working a lot with the queer people and trans people and uh, in this revolution actually I've heard a lot about them and, and they've come on stage when there was 50,000 people in Berlin and they had a little speech. And That's, uh, that's yes. you know, really encouraging to hear because, you know, that's sort of what I was thinking about and how, how much even amongst, it, I know it's such a, every society is such a cross section. So there might be someone there looking for sexual revolution for straight people, but not for queer people. There are all sorts of lines. There'll be other people who will be looking for sexual revolution for everybody. There'll be people who'll be too frightened to say they're queer. But it's interesting what you said, that young men can go to the doctor and get a paper saying they're mentally ill. So what if they're caught in some kind of homosexual activity, they show this paper to the police? So the police have to let them go? Yeah, like if they're like, look like, because like, they arrest girls for like obviously not wearing a scarf properly and stuff, but they would sometimes come and arrest boys for like I don't know being like wearing short skirt, short sleeve, and I don't know. They would just like so like randomly they would stop you in the street and like obviously if you like really openly feminine like as a boy like they would come and be like I see I see the law is if they act if they catch you if someone sees you having sex they put you in a bag and they throw you down the hill. For boys, um, for girls, as long as I knew, I don't know exactly. Maybe you know, but um, I know there are two girls in the prison at the moment that they are facing um, getting hung. Uh, well, um, I I just want to say solidarity to all of our queer siblings in Iran who must be very frightened and also, you know, very brave to be their true selves and. Regine, I'm so happy that you got out when you did. And I also, you know, don't want everyone to have to get out. I want it to change. And so, you know, we we will put all of the, the, the suggestions you made in the show notes so that anybody listening to this podcast now, just go to the show notes and just do one of those actions. Try something because, you know, there can be like a moment of hope for somebody if you pay for a VPN card or you manage to get some money across or you just keep this dialogue going and keep shining a light on the human rights violations in Iran right now. It's just so important that we all keep our part in this, whatever that part is, because that will keep hope alive for people who are really, really facing very, very frightening abuses of power. Um, Ramita, was there anything else that you wanted to talk about? Um, I was going to say, obviously, I'm I'm not a gay Iranian, so I can't speak for gay Iranians. Um, but I went to quite a few gay parties in Tehran. Obviously, these are uptown parties. Uptown is the richer, more secular part of town. Um, but I thought you might enjoy the fact that <laughs> um, there's a group of women, um, gay women, uh, I spent time with, and they like to call themselves Lesbolla, which I quite liked. Mm. Also, the <laughs> also the law changed a few years ago. Now, the law in Iran changes quite regularly, so I don't know if it's changed since. But last time I checked, I researched for the book. Um, if you're a gay man and you are caught having sex, and you need you need witnesses. Um, you need people to witness you in the act. 
Now, if you are the receiver in sex as a gay man, you can be executed. But if you are the giver, you get away with being flogged. How fucked up is that? I mean... Right? That tells you something so many about... levels of horror. The, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the hypocrisy of the patriarchal clerical regime. But it's also, what is that? That is saying a greater punishment for what is perceived to be the feminine Exactly, part of that. yeah. That, that before, for in some way or another daring to be, you know, in their minds womanly. Yeah, notions of manhood, exactly. I mean... Extraordinary, right? It's genuinely, genuinely horrifying. Mm. Um, I, I, I'm so sorry. I just feel like you must be, like, in tension and anxiety and stress and pain every day while this is going on. And it's made me feel, this extra conversation has made me feel even more motivated to try and do something to help because, you know, this is it. It's it. And I'm glad we've had this this sort of more quiet time to talk about it because some of this feels more like we need to talk about this in a studio and not in front of an audience somehow because some of it's more intimate. And I really appreciate you coming back uh, to talk more about this because I know how painful it must be. Thank you. We should give a big shout out to the LGBT Iranian community, certainly in England and in America. So they have been instrumental in organizing some of these protests outside Iran. It's been really interesting talking to them because, of course, they have been organizing and protesting for a very long time. So they have those structures in place. And what I found really interesting, it's the LGBTQ uh, groups who have managed to get Iranians of all shades, political shades and colors together They've managed to unite us in a way that the different political parties and factions haven't managed to. That's extremely interesting. And any kind of unity at the moment is has got to be the way forward. Whatever, whatever we can do to unify on whatever we agree on has got to be the way forward because lives are being lost and destroyed. So, you know, whatever's going on, press forward. If you're listening to this, if you know anyone who has influence, money, platform, do whatever you can. Um, is there anything else you wanted to say? Just thank you so much, Deborah, for making the time for this. Oh, God, no, of course. Sorry, Regine, what were you going to say? Um, I've got two things. Yeah, one is if people want more information, um, I just want to have a shout out for all the Iranian filmmakers they all got like banned one by one, but when we were kids, there was a lot more of them active. And despite all the censorship and all the limitations, they managed to make a lot of really films that they address like social issues and female woman issues and stuff. And um, there's a lot of Iranian films that went to Cannes. And so if you look it up, you can always find mm. Iranian films with subtitles. Um, there's one called uh, The Day I Became a Woman. It's three short stories. Um, there's one called Offside. It's about some girls going to um, try to go and watch football in the stadium. Uh, and many, many more. Um, yeah, hands down, like the Iranian filmmakers. And um, there's a lot you can watch. The power of story. Yeah. It's never to be underestimated. It's almost the only thing we've got to build empathy, camaraderie, inspire action it's almost all we've got so keep telling stories i mean they open our eyes um obviously we didn't have any much more as as we said we didn't have internet and stuff and like it was really important to be able to watch them films before they get more censored and the reason that government censor story is story is powerful and so when the uk government is saying hey every student should do maths till 18 but they don't care about story there's a reason for that if you learn to count money, but you don't learn to tell stories, then you can't bring in governments down. So it's 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 a really important thing. Share that's a great point, actually, Regine. Share Iranian stories from Iranian filmmakers. Do your research. Uh, there's ones Regine mentioned there, but there's other ones as well. Um, and share those stories because those stories will move people to act. 
and also, as you say, give people insight into what's really going on. Thank you so much. I so appreciate you making this extra time. It's really made a big difference to this podcast. I think you're both absolutely extraordinary people. No, thank you. It means a lot. Thank you very much. Can I say something that is not related to yeah. uh, sex? Just I did. <laughs> I just um, really wanted to voice my because um, it just f- took me 15 years to get my passport. So now I would like to practice my rights. Go for it. Speech, if that's all right. <laughs> um, I wrote it down because I thought I'm going to get nervous. Um, I was going to say, if anyone agrees with me, they can like, write this with their own um, words to whoever they think um, makes this decisions in their country. So it says, uh, Dear Home Secretary, I grew up under an Islamic regime. Putting the name of the Sepaha Pastor on Hezbollah and Taliban in the list of terrorists is a nice gesture, but you're 44 years late and it's not good enough. Uh, why don't you put all the Iranian ambassadors and their families in detention centers like you did unrightfully to any Iranian and Afghan refugee that you didn't believe their story? Send them to Rwanda, hey. It's mass murder, not a good enough reason for you. Jean, your words are very, very powerful and very, very timely. Bloody Thank hope they do so that. <laughs> much. Absolutely. I love incredible. that idea. Thank you both. And then <laughs> lock them all up. Come around to my house. I really want you both to come around to my house for dinner. Thank you. But I will not cook. Tom will cook. I'd love to. <laughs> Thank you so much, Zebra. I'm keep telling everyone. It's like you know when you see you're a hero and you get disappointed, and then you I met you and oh, I'm like, that's even stop, stop more, it! But. Honestly, I'm a massive numpty. <laughs> Thank you so much. That's so kind of you, though. Um, but listen, you are both. I mean, I mean, you both actually are heroes. I'm a numpty with the podcast, but thank you so much. I shouldn't say that because I try and get other women not to do themselves down. It's just that that moment of going, oh God, in the face of everything you've been through and done, I just feel, you know, when people say they're humbled when they get an award and you're like, no, you're not, no, you're not, you're not humbled when you get an Oscar. It's the opposite of what you are. But I actually do feel humble given your life experience and your, your power. And so I, I thank you just for coming to have this conversation. I think you're both absolutely wonderful. I might go and have a Thanks cry so now. <laughs> Thank you for Iran. Thank you so much. Thank you.